we'll talk a little bit more about model diagnostics and threats to the validity of a linear model, in particular, looking at the impact that outliers or high influence observations can have on a fit. And we'll go over one way to fix the problems that can be caused by that. Then we'll go over linear models for prediction. We've talked a lot <clears throat> about linear models for description and for causal inference, but we haven't really talked about linear models to make predictions. And in particular, how do you quantify the uncertainty that you have about a prediction from a linear model? Let's talk about outliers and the impact that they can have on your regression. So on the right, here are six examples of data sets, just simple linear regression type data sets where you have a predictor variable on the x-axis and a response variable on the y-axis, and it's a scatter plot. And also in each of these plots, there's at least one outlier. And so not only do you see the scatter plot of x versus y and the fitted regression line, you also see the residual plot. Okay, example one, the outlier is close to the middle of the x's, like the middle of the x's is over here, it's here, but it's far on the y-axis from the other points, especially near its x value. It does not have a huge impact on the residuals of the fitted line. It doesn't pull the line very far towards itself. Here's another example where you have a point that's on the x-axis, sorry, that's far away from the other points on the x-axis, but it actually is very close to the line that you would naturally draw through the other points. So it also doesn't have a very big impact on where the line goes because it would have gone close to it anyway. Like even if this weren't here, the line would have gone close to it. The residuals look pretty random for the other points. Here's an example where you have an outlier that's far away from the other points on the x-axis, and it also has a big residual, right? It's also far on the y-axis from where you'd expect it to be given the line through the other points. And this type of point really does pull the line towards itself more. You can see there's like a pattern in the residuals that they tend to be above zero here and then below zero here because it's tilted the line up towards itself. The general principle is that points that are far away from the center of the predictor variables have more leverage. Like you can think of it as they have a lever and the longer a lever is, the more leverage you have. The farther away you are from the center of the points, the more impact you can have on the line that actually gets fit. There's this formula for leverage, which is the amount by which a unit change in the y value of a point would change where the line is at that point's x value. It's a bit of a complicated looking formula, but the key thing is that it depends on the difference between the location of that point's x value and the average of the x of the square. The higher that is, the higher the leverage. To the extent that you can control the area from which you're sampling your x's, you might want to try to fill in space between any outlier x values so that they don't have an outsized influence on your regression line. Because you don't want the line that you fit to depend very strongly on just one point. Here's an example, number five, where the residual is low. It's close to the line, but the reason why it's close to the line is because it would have pulled the line close to itself wherever it was because the other points are just a blob. There's no linear relationship here. So the best fit line is just going to go to wherever you put a point that's this far away from the others because it has high leverage, but also a lot of influence. Cook's distance is another formula for assessing the influence that a single point might have on your regression. And what it does is it compares the y hat for each observation. It compares the linear model prediction for that observation, where the line would be at that xj, to 
where a line that was fit without the ith observation would be. So it fits a line with all the data, which is just this line. And then it would also fit a line without this point being present and it would probably look closer to a flat line. And then for every point in the data set, it takes the difference between the two lines squared. So if the two lines are very different with the point and without the point, that shows that the point has a really big influence on the fitted line. This is sometimes a diagnostic which is used, like R can compute it for you. It can tell you which points have a really big Cook's distance. And then there are rules of thumb for what's troublesome for one point having too big an influence on your results. We'll look at outliers and their impact and a potential way to fix the problem, which is to take transformations of the variables that are involved. But first, let's just look at the data. We're going to load this data set that's freely available with R called MAMMALS. The MAMMALS data set compares the mass of the body to the mass of the brain for a whole bunch of mammals. Here's body. You could maybe guess what these guys are. Elephants. And here's brain. Here's body versus brain. And you can see that there are two very influential points here, right? These points have very high leverage because they're very far away from you know, the center of the axis. So these are two very high leverage data points, the mammals that have such big bodies and big brains. Here's a summary of the fit. The standard error of the line that we fit was 0.05. We might be skeptical of this because one of the things that we've learned is that constant variance, while it doesn't matter for what line you actually fit from the data, it does matter for estimating standard errors. Here's the line. Here we're creating the residuals by doing resid of the model. And we're creating the predicted Y values by doing predict of the model. Here are the residuals plotted in order. Most of them are less than zero. They're not evenly scattered above zero. This giant one, which is high, is making all the others go below to average out. Here's the plot where on the x-axis you put the predicted y, and on the y-axis you put the residual. And you can see that obviously there's not constant variance of the residuals for bigger X's, the residuals tend to be bigger. And then there's also this outlier over here. Can anyone guess what this would be? So this is not such a big body, but a very big brain. This is humans. And this is like Asian elephant, and this is African elephant. So anyway, obviously the equal variance assumption is violated. And so we probably wouldn't trust our standard error estimate that LM gives us, because that's based on the assumption that the variance is constant across observations. Just to, again, show how Bootstrap does a better job at standard errors, because it's robust to violations of assumptions. So we had these outliers, which lead to violations of the assumptions that you need for valid standard error estimation for the regression coefficient we can instead estimate the, the standard error of the regression coefficient using bootstrap. And this is just the same old story. We're gonna do 500 bootstraps. We'll scramble the data with the replacement and we'll refit our model to the scrambled bootstrap sample data and we'll store the result. And so the standard error is the standard deviation of all the bootstrap estimates, and it's 0.34, which is way bigger than 0.05, which makes sense, right? If it's really so dependent on just a couple of data points, you could imagine that if those data points were a little different, as they will be in the bootstrap samples, if you, in one bootstrap sample, you may get two of this guy, in another bootstrap sample, you may get none of this guy. And so then the line will vary considerably. It will properly capture that dependence on just a couple of data points, whereas the LM formula 
does not capture that. It doesn't understand how sensitive to just a couple of observations the standard error is. So just yet again, bootstrap doesn't lie for standard errors, but LM does if assumptions are violated. But let's get back to outliers. We have this fit, which might look okay to the naked eye, but all these points are really clustered down near zero, and it's hard to actually see if it's a good fit. And when you look at the residuals, the line really is overestimating the brain size for most of the body sizes for the little guys because of these hugely influential points that had really big bodies. So one thing you can do is take the log of each of the variables and then see if the linear model fits better to the transformed variables. So, so we're going to redefine mammal's body to be the log of mammal's body. And we're going to redefine mammal's brain to be the log of mammal's brain. And now let's plot how log brain versus log body looks. This is much better, right? No outliers, taking the log pulls things closer together. This is clearly a linear pattern. We can fit another model to it. I would trust this standard error because linearity is pretty clearly satisfied here and the variance of the points is approximately constant around the line that would be fit through it. So I didn't really cover because there's no good answer for whether to get rid of outliers. If you can somehow be confident that they don't represent the truth, like a blood pressure of 10 million or something, you can throw it away because it's essentially missing. But otherwise, it's hard to know what to do. In the mammals data, for example, it wouldn't necessarily make sense to throw away the big ones. They're not wrong. There's something that you need to account for. You could limit your modeling to lower values of X and say maybe a linear model holds uh, for body sizes that are less than 100 or something and restrict yourself to that just because that's where you're able to model things. But there's not really a science to it. Right? People have thought about it a lot, I guess. Maybe there are some who would disagree with that assessment, but I don't think there's a great general system for dealing with outliers when you're not sure if they represent the truth, but the transformation approach can sometimes work well. And there are also robust regressions that are not so sensitive to outliers that you can also consider using. If you have a simple linear regression, you could just look, but if you have a multiple linear regression where you have a lot of predictors, it's not going to be obvious from graphing that there's a point that's far away from the center of the x's. You can't visualize that. It can be far from the center without even being far on any single value of the x's. And one way then to identify outliers is to just look at these, these metrics. They're not necessarily outliers, but they're influential. Or there's a point with large Cook's distance. So if you fit the regression with it versus without it, the line shifts considerably, then those are influential points and you might be having this issue. Both of these metrics generalize to the multivariate case. But something that R does is it makes these plots. We just fit our model, we called it fit. If you do plot fit, even if it's a multivariate model, so here it says, hit return to see next plot. So one thing it does is just that standard residual plot that we always do. Then hit return to see next plot. I'll hit it again. This is kind of garbage. We don't care about this. This is just assessing whether the errors are normal. And we don't really care if the errors are normal usually. OK, here's fitted values versus standardized residuals, where they divide the residuals by the standard error. and then. Here is the one that I wanted to show you. On the x-axis is leverage, and on the y-axis is the standardized residual. You can see the very high leverage points, and things that fall outside of this curve are concerning. They might have like a very high influence on the regression. So Asian elephant and African elephant were the ones that were 
identified. Now let's talk about regression for prediction. But before we do that in a little review, we've used regression for a bunch of different things so far. One thing that we've used it for is description. The coefficient estimate and its confidence interval can be viewed as a description of the association between two variables. So an example we looked at was cancer death rate per 100,000 versus poverty in counties in the U.S. And we fit a linear regression to describe the strength of association between these two variables at the county level. And we found that the slope was about 1.9. The standard error was 0.07. So confidence interval 1.9 plus or minus 2 times 0.07. That's a linear model for description. And you would interpret the coefficient as a county with poverty percentage one higher than another county is expected to have a cancer death rate per 100,000. That's 1.9 higher on average, and then a confidence interval for that. Another descriptive example is using the F test when you have a categorical variable to test whether there are differences between the response variable at the different levels of the categorical variable and half set the different exercise levels, like one, two, and three, being lots of exercise, medium, a little bit. How well you do predicting um, the blood pressure in these three groups when you fit this model is statistically significantly better than if you just took the overall mean and used that. So that tells you that there's some difference between the groups. They're not all the same. And you can estimate what the mean is in each group and get confidence intervals for it using the regression. So again, this isn't prediction or causal inference, it's just description. There's a difference. And then the last example of description that I'll give is how associations can change with values of other covariates. From regression and other stories, a child and mother test scores can vary with mother's education. And again, this is just descriptive. Right? We're not saying that anything is because of anything, and we're not really trying to predict anyone's score. We're just saying, here's the association, and here's how it changes with another covariate. Of course, we've also done a whole lot of causal inference, tons of standardization, and you no know, regression was a key ingredient in standardization. We also looked at how you would analyze an RCT with a regression, where you know, in an RCT, you could just do a simple comparison and interpret it causally. We also looked at doing adjusted and unadjusted regression in RCTs, and adjusted does better. But at the beginning of the class, we also said that you could use linear regressions for prediction, and the conditional expectation of an outcome variable given values of predictor variables, which is what the regression line is, by many definitions, the best prediction you can make for the outcome given the predictors. So in, in that sense, it's automatic how you use a regression for prediction, right? If you are given some values of the predictor variables, you just look at where the regression line lies for those predictor variables, and that is your best point estimate guess, your best single guess for what the outcome is likely to be given those predictor values, but we haven't really gone over how to do uncertainty quantification for predictions. Like we did bootstrap for effect estimates with the causal inference, and we did confidence intervals for individual coefficients with description, but we haven't done uncertainty quantification for prediction. So here's an example of a plot looking at latitude as a predictor variable and mortality from skin cancer as the response variable. Each point is a city, by the way. And as you get farther from the equator, the sun is less strong and mortality from skin cancer goes down. Like a natural question to ask is what about for a new city that has never measured its skin cancer mortality rate, its latitude? what would you predict that its, that its skin cancer rate would be? And what's your uncertainty about that prediction? So let's say there's some new city. What are we? I think New York is like 45, I think, 
And let's say New York is in here. So that would be, if you go up to the line, it's at 125. So that would be your best guess, would just be the point on the line corresponding to the latitude. What's your uncertainty? There are two ways you might want to summarize your uncertainty. One is, what is your uncertainty about that being your best guess? So what's the range that you think the regression line might be at latitude 45? And that's these green lines on the plot. These are the confidence interval for the regression line. And then the other thing that you might want to buy your uncertainty about is the prediction for the particular city. And your uncertainty about that comes from a combination of being uncertain about exactly where the line is and then the fact that there's noise added to the line for the individual observations. Now, that means that the purple lines, which are giving you uncertainty for predictions about individual observations, they depend heavily on assumptions about what that error distribution is. You need constant variance and it should also be normal. The confidence intervals for the line still don't depend on that assumption, but now we really care about the normality assumption once we're trying to make predictions for an individual unit. So the green lines, again, they just come from the sampling variability of the regression line with different sets of cities, the line would wiggle around a little bit, right? If you took bootstrap samples of these cities with each bootstrap sample, you could imagine the line tilting around and shifting up and down a tiny bit within the range of these green lines, but it's not going to go too far. The purple lines come from the sampling variability of the line, again, plus the noise sigma squared from your regression model. So that's to repeat myself, why it's so important that the noise truly be normal if you're going to quantify probabilities of a point being within a certain range. Both intervals, both the green interval for the line and the purple interval for the points get wider as you move away from the center of the data. And I think this kind of makes sense because if you imagine toggling the slope of the line, that will have a bigger impact on where points towards the end of the line wind up than points at the beginning. Like imagine a seesaw. The seesaw is always at the same point at the middle, right, as it goes up and down. So the confidence interval is narrower in the middle of the X's as uncertainty about the slope tilts the line and has a big impact on where the points at the end of the line go. It has very little impact on where the middle of the line goes. So we're going to do another little lab on prediction intervals. We're going to use another little toy data set that comes with R. It's called Faithful. So this is data from Old Faithful, the geyser in Yellowstone National Park. It's called Old Faithful because periodically it always erupts, but it's not exactly periodically. The number of bursts in a given eruption is one variable, and then the time that you need to wait until the next time it goes off is another variable. The more it lets off steam, the longer until it needs to let off steam again. If the number of eruptions in a given session of erupting is higher, then it's longer until the next eruption session. So we can fit a model to this with waiting as the response variable, how long till the next eruption, and number of eruptions at the last one as the predictor variable. And we can add the line, looks like a good fit. So now let's get a prediction interval for what the waiting time will be at a new point. Let's say there were just five eruptions and you want a prediction interval for how long you're going to need to wait for the next one. You can do predict mod new data equals data frame. It's important that it's a data frame. Predict expects a data frame for your new data. And then something that has the same name as the predictor variable that you used or predictor variables. So eruptions equals five because we want the interval for, for a point where at right after there had been five eruptions. And then you say interval equals predict because you want this for like a new point, not for the line. And so here's the prediction that it'll be 87 minutes. And then the lower and upper confidence bounds for that prediction for the new point 
are 75.4 to 98.8. But what's the confidence interval around this prediction? That really is the conditional expectation at five. So ignoring the noise of the individual observations, you do the same thing, but you just do interval equals confidence instead of predict. And you get a much narrower confidence interval, right? Again, like this is the estimate of where the line is when there have been five eruptions, but the lower bound of the confidence interval for the line is much closer to this than, than it was for a point. Because again, the point has uncertainty about the line plus noise from the individual observations. And this is just the uncertainty about the line. So the predict interval 95% of the time will contain the actual new observation. Whereas the confidence interval, 95% um, of the time will contain the true regression line. 